Doop de doop de doop. Whee! Hi, chess kids. Playful Squirrel here, and today I have the one pure king endgame that you need to know to be a great endgame player, and just to understand chess and to understand your king. There is only one endgame that exists with two kings, and it's king versus king. Now, some of you may already know that this position should normally be a draw in chess. The king is not allowed to capture the other king. However, at kids' chess tournaments, people don't always know that, and I have been a tournament director at a tournament where two kids played this position with king and king against each other for a long, long time, and then finally one of them came over to record the score and said that somehow white or black, one of them had won the game, which astonished everybody, but the kids agreed that somebody had won, so we marked it as somebody had won. However, in general, this endgame should never be possible for either side to win because you're not allowed to walk onto a square where you can capture the opponent's king because it's illegal to walk onto a square where he can capture you. Since the two kings move the same as each other, it's technically illegal to go here. And so, you know, the, the, the way this should go is the kings just walk back and forth around each other like this, right? And no one can ever really get in the other guy's face to grab him or land a punch or anything like that. And they just keep dancing around like this. And this is a typical king dance that would show that this should probably end up in a draw. But let me take you back here. And suggest an interesting side game to you. And once I tell you this game, I would like you to pause the video and go off and practice this game against somebody else. You don't need much. You just need kinks. You don't even need a complete set. Your mom and dad could probably handle this game because they don't have to remember how any pieces other than the kings move. And the king's one of the simplest pieces to move, right? Because the king goes exactly one space in exactly any direction. It's pretty simple to remember. I think your parents can get that one. So I'm going to explain this game to you, and then I want you to pause the video and play this game some for yourself before you come back here and learn about how this game works, and what the answer to the game is. Here are the rules of the game. You've just got kings, and if the white king gets to c8 or a8, then white wins. If the black king gets first before white to c1 or a1, then black wins. You got that? Where are the four winning squares? There are two for white. They are a8 and c8 far, far side of the board, off in the corner. And for black, they are C1 and A1, the far, far side of the board down in the corner. So those are the rules of the game. All right, I trust if you wanted to go play this, you've paused it now. Now I'm going to start explaining how this game works to you. On the first move, white has three choices of where to go. Miraculously, one of these moves wins, one of them draws, and one of them loses. White can actually play one move on the first move so bad that black wins this game. All right, let's see how it works. First, I think the most obvious move that most people will try first is they'll try king g2. Basically, the idea is they're running their king as fast as possible towards these two squares. And people who realize that are already in good shape because they realize that the fastest way the king can move is diagonal. If it wants to get over there, it's much faster to zip along this diagonal, well, as much as a king can zip, than it is to climb a bunch of stairs, right? Almost like the difference between a zip line and a staircase in terms of the difference in speed, right? It's twice as fast to cruise down this diagonal. So that makes a lot of sense. The king just rushes towards that spot. And if your opponent just tries to rush towards you as fast as possible as well, then you may get to this position here. And this may have happened the first time you tried this king game against somebody else. It's a very logical way for it to happen. What happens now is the white king can't keep going because the black king is covering the squares that the white king wanted to go through. And so let's say you want to go towards these squares. Well, the best you can do is go left. But every time you go left, your opponent should be able to mirror you and cover every square you would need to go through to advance up the board. Actually, if black from now on simply mirrors every move that you make, every time you go left, he goes left. Every time you go right, he goes right. If black simply does that, they will now be able to draw the game and it will become just as boring as any normal king versus king endgame in a chess tournament because it will be a draw and you will move back and forth a bunch of times 
getting bored and then more bored and then so bored that you wonder, shouldn't we maybe put a pawn on the board to make this game more interesting? Or maybe we'll go back to the video and Playful Squirrel will explain to us how this thing works. All right, so the king is able to perfectly shield everywhere the white king needs to advance and the white king is blocked and there's no progress to be made. So that's one good example of how the move king g2 can actually lead to a draw. All right, because one thing that you need to do to win this game is you need to get up the board. But to get up the board, it's tricky. You need to actually get into a situation like this where it's not your move to step to the side because every time you step aside, he blocks you. You need to get into a position like this where it's your opponent's move so that your opponent is going to have to step out of your way. Whichever way they go, they're not going to be able to cover all three of these squares when they step out of the way of your king, right? So, for example, if they come, um, well, if we switched whose move it was, which we'll do with a little triangle. If we switch whose move it is here, black's going to have to make a move like king c6 that lets you play king a5, or black's going to have to play a move like king a6 that lets you play king c5. And now we see the mechanism for starting to move up the board and gain an advantage here for white. All right. So coming back here, the best first move for white and the one that wins is king to h2, not king g2. It's not just rushing the fastest you can over here, but it's setting up a situation where you have looked in advance that when the kings face off, the other person's king is going to have to step out of your way. So this king moves up. For example, you move up. He moves up, you move up. Now the kings are facing each other, but whose move is it? Very importantly, it is black's move here. This is sometimes called Zugzwang, when you have a situation where your opponent doesn't want to move, but they have to. If you had to move here, which you wouldn't want to either, it would be Zugzwang on you. But here you're very lucky that Zwang is on your opponent, so he has to make some Zugs, that's German for moves. So he keeps having to step out of your way. Now, so far, I haven't been taking advantage of my chance to run around him, right? Already back here, when he steps to the side, I could be running around him. But what's my goal? Do I win the game if I get to f8? Have you guys forgotten the goal of this game? No, you haven't. You know what the goal is. We're trying to get here. So for now, we're happy to just keep the situation where he always has to step out of our way. And we'll wait till we're on a file that's close to the winning squares. And then we'll start walking around our opponent, okay? So if he started backtracking for some reason over here, if he forgot that the winning squares were here, then of course we would start walking around him. And you can see this king is, uh-oh, it's suddenly getting really close to these winning squares, right? And black shuffles back trying to stop us, but it's too late. He just can't stop us anymore, right? And next move is touchdown. So let's say he keeps going towards the side of the board that has the goal, right? At some point, we reach the B file. And the B file is really cool because the B file is next to the two winning squares. So if he steps to the A file, we can go around him and get to C8. And if he steps to the C file, we can get around him and go to A8. There's no longer any way for him to stop us, right? He can get, he can get back in front and take this square. But every time he comes back, words, we're always going to be able to jump in front of him and set up the opposition. And a Zugzwang. And again, he's going to have to step to one side or the other. We're going to go around him. You guys are going to start getting used to this pattern of seeing us get around him and get to the win. Yes. All right. So we're going to go back here to the very beginning, and I'm going to show you one more example. Let's say your opponent plays king to g8. Should you now start rushing up on this diagonal, or should you stay on the same color square as him a certain number of hops away where he's always going to have to step out of your way. The correct answer is coming. Pause your video if you don't want to know. Oh, is it G3? Is it G2? Is it G3? Is it G2? It's G2. We need to stay totally opposite him. If he ever comes up, we'll come up. But if he keeps running along this way, we're going to keep the same number of squares away from him, which is going to be an odd number of squares between us, but you can just measure it by being on the same color as him. And we're going to keep doing this till we get to which file? The file to be on. The B file, of course. We get there. And now we'll start going around him and heading towards this. All right? And if he comes up, which square should we go to? The dark square or the light square here? What do you think? Or should we run away backwards? The light square. Now we've got that opposition again. 
And if he comes for if he comes to the side, we'll go around him again. If he comes forward, we'll end up having the opposition when the two kings come head to head and they can't move anymore because they're each controlling these three spaces. And they're like, you move, no, you move, no, you move, no, you move. And then you say, it's your turn, so you must move, my friend. And you, uh, fine, I'll move. And then you get around him and he says, no more. And you say, more. That's what I always say with nuts, right? My mom's always like, no more. And I'm like, more. Yes. Let's go all the way to C8 where there's an all-you-can-eat buffet of acorns. Yes, he got there. So I'm going to leave you guys with one question to think about. Here it is. If white in this position on the first move had played king to g1, how could black turn the tables on white and win this game and get his king to c1 or a1? Let me know the answer next time I see you. And in the meantime, I highly recommend that you practice this mini game several times with friends or family or friends who happen to be in your family because this is very very useful for learning how the king moves and the king by nature of the rules of chess is in every end game so anytime you want to win an end game you pretty much have to know how to move your king this will teach you how to move him how he fights with the other king and all that so Good luck to all of you. Keep practicing. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you would like to see more videos like this. Coming up next will be the five pawn endgames that every chess kid must know. Do you know them yet? Maybe, but maybe not. We'll see you next time. Bye.